Welcome everyone to Moms for America Healing of America seminar. My name is Julene Jackson. I'm the National Vice President for Moms for America over Cottage Meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've been studying together for the last six weeks in a series called Healing of America. We finished our first book, God's Hand in the Building of America. It's a four-week seminar. And now we are in our second book, The Charter of Freedom, which is the Constitution from the viewpoint of the Founding Fathers. We're in section two today. It's fill in the blank. The key is in the back. If you ever have to miss a class, you um, can always watch the recorded class. It goes up online usually Friday or Saturday morning invite feel free to invite your your children your friends your neighbors your family members it's easy to get caught up you might want to start thinking about purchasing the third manual sometimes i think it's maybe taking two weeks and that third manual is called the attacks of the charter of freedom the attacks on the charter of freedom well ladies okay are we ready did you get a chance to do your studies are you being good students are you filling in the blanks If not, you can always go and do it afterwards. But um, last week we talked about the legislative branch. So we know there are seven articles in the constitution and 27 amendments. And those seven articles, an easy way to remember them is through, can you see that? Does that look right to you? Legislative. The acronym, the first one is legislative. Today, we're going to study the executive branch and the judicial branch. So write that up at the top of this section as well, legislature. And Vivian sent out that one page outline of the constitution, which I've actually kind of memorized the constitution off that one page. Just, just, you know, a few words that help me explain what each amendment is and a little bit about the seven articles. And so um, I hope everyone was able to get that uh, one page outlined. If not, uh, hit up me or Vivian at the end and we can resend it to you. But we talked about last week, the legislative branch. That was the very first article. It was supposed to be preeminent because it represented the voice of the people. The first article, the uh, founders were trying to say something to us. So it establishes the House and the Senate. And it also um, puts forth the 20 enumerated powers that they intended for Congress to be able to act under. And we're gonna talk about in the third seminar how some of the newer amendments, the 16th Amendment and the 17th Amendment have disrupted that balance of power in Congress. Now remember how we talked about the purpose of the constitution was to protect our rights and to protect the rights of our families. Our founders knew that the core unit that determines the strength of society is the family. So they wanted to foster and protect its integrity. And so um, that's what the constitution was going to do. And also they intended that our rights came from God, not from government. And so God had the uh, responsibility and the right to define what our rights are. And Thomas Jefferson said that in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And to protect those rights, God has revealed certain principles of divine law. And those, uh, you find divine law in his holy word in the Bible. And so the founders knew this. Remember Thomas Jefferson spent 16 days gleaning over uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy and numbers and pulled out ancient principles from the scripture and embedded them in those first two paragraphs in the Declaration of Independence. Someone once told me our inalienable rights are founded scripture by thou shalt, thou shalt love God, thou shalt honor, you know, love thy neighbor, that the thou shalts are our rights and the thou shalt nots are our inalienable wrongs. And so I thought that was kind of a clever way that thou shalts are our inalienable rights and the thou shalt nots are our inalienable wrongs that do not come from God and deserve no protection. So nowadays, instead of looking to God and in his holy word to find out, you know, what these rights are that we've been endowed with from God, we're looking to government. 
We're looking to, you know, secular or er, er, secular organizations or the irreligious or mainstream media to define what our rights are. And, and they're starting to tamper with the original intent of the Constitution. And so as we study this Constitution the next three weeks from the viewpoint of the founding fathers, we'll understand what they intended when they uh, put forth what they did, and we'll also be able to better recognize propaganda that's being peddled by modern courts or other media sources and entities. So as we know what the founders intended, we know how to help reestablish it. Remember only about 15% of the constitution has been changed. And I believe, I believe a healed constitution will be one of the tools that the, the God uses to heal our land. Remember in second Chronicles, he talks about how he can heal our land if we will turn to him and, and turn from our wicked ways. And some of our wicked ways is just apathy, just not caring, just not taking any interest to know, you know, what God gave us through this constitution that our founders said was struck off by the hand of God. They acknowledge that. And so anyways, let's turn to section two of book two today. And I think, um, also, if I could just recommend, I recommended this book last week, but I was out of town, so I didn't lug it with me. It's called The Making of America, and you can't get it on our website. I checked, but Thomas Jefferson Center uh, publishes this and also the National Center for Constitutional Studies. And one book, it has a white cover and one book has this cover. I think I, I like the white cover better that comes from Thomas Jefferson Center because they made a few little additions, but this is the one I have and it's good. What this does, it takes every article, every section, every clause and explains it from the viewpoint of the founders and actually gives quotes from the founders what they meant for every single article, section and clause. So we kind of go through quickly in this seminar, but if, if there's some things you're like, hmm, I don't quite still understand that, this is such a good resource. I would highly recommend this book because it's just straight quotes from the founding men that wrote this document explaining why they, they put it the way they did in the constitution. And so the desire of our founders were to limit the to limit the, the federal government. They had just won a war from an overly oppressive uh, English government. And so they're very aware of not giving too much power to uh, the federal government. In fact, James Madison, remember he was the father of the constitution said that we want to structure the constitution so that the powers delegated to the federal government will be few. And that's what is specifies in amendment nine and 10 in the constitution. So in George Washington's day, he had 350 employees to oversee 3 million people in George Washington's day. Now, according to our population right now, we have a hundred times the employees uh, based on our current population that we should have. So we are a bloated, I'm gonna tell you something that you probably don't know, we're bloated. Our government, you do know that, I'm kidding, is, 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 is more excessive than it needs to be the employees that we have. So the founders just intended the president to have six duties. And, and the first one was to be the chief of state over the population of America. We have about 330 million right now in America. In my book, it says 350, but I think it's about 332 million. He's to be commander over the uh, military force of about 2.5 million. He's to be the chief executive officer over the whole executive branch. And um, so in Washington's day, Washington had four cabinet members. We have 15 cabinet members now. And we're gonna talk about how that has increased the size and the reach of the executive branch, having that many uh, uh, agencies and that many administrative agencies under each one of those agencies. He's to be the chief diplomat in foreign relations, the chief architect for needed legislation, and he also can grant pardons or reprieves when he feels justice requires them. So that was the six duties that they intended. 
I want to recommend a 13 minute video. Ladies, write this down at the top of this page. The video is called the most powerful political office in the world. Just Google it. The most powerful political office in the world. And it's only a 13 minute little YouTube clip, but it shows what the in founders intended the president to be able to oversee and what he actually oversees now and how it's just too much really for one man to be able to oversee all the responsibility of all these agencies such as agriculture, commerce, defense, education, energy, health and human services, homeland security, HUD, Interior, Justice, Labor, State Department, Transportation, the Treasury, and Veteran Affairs. Now there's 15 different agencies and there's about 500 different bureaus underneath them and about 2,600 groupings under those 15 agencies. And so you can see how the executive branch has become way more powerful than our founders intended. And we will talk in seminar three, how that happened. We'll even talk a little bit today under the new deal, how government was expanded and how the executive branch was expanded. So article two uh, talks about the executive branch, article one, the legislative branch, article two talks about the office of the president, how he was to be the chief servant of the people. There's only four sections. Remember there was 10 sections in article one. There's only four sections in article two. And you know, it, it talks about in that first section, how many presidents should we have? Some wanted one, some wanted uh, three, some wanted to have a president over every state. They talked about what should be the educational background of presidents. Should they have property holdings? This is all um, dealt with in section one. And, um, you know, it took 60 votes, ballots for the Constitutional Convention to finally figure out how they should elect the president. And they came, that's when they decided upon the Electoral College, which uh, many people think should be done away with. And that would be a grave mistake. And that would be a removal of a check and balance if we did do away with the Electoral College. So the president, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The president serves for four years. The founding fathers didn't believe in term limits. They believed that the best term limit they could have was voting. If you didn't like a president, just vote him out of office. And so they didn't include term limits uh, when they originally wrote the constitution. And you know who set the best example for term limits was George Washington, because he didn't believe that we should be career politician or we should get wealthy off of you know, our service in the government. So after two terms, he uh, did not run again and went back home. And every president after that um, kind of adhered to George Washington's example. They only ran twice. And then something happened in 1933, a president came along that wanted to keep running and running and serving. And that was Franklin Delaware uh, Roosevelt. And under him, he authored the new deal and he left, put us on the road to a big government. That was his legacy. And he actually was running for the fourth term when he died in office in 1945. And just a year or two after Congress passed an amendment to the Constitution, declaring only two term limits because of what Roosevelt did in the 12 years he was in the executive branch. He expanded, gave us, uh, put us on the road to welfare, Medicare, federal housing agencies, social security Act, so many uh, things to grow that executive branch under the big deal, um, uh, the new deal. Yeah, it was a big deal and a new deal that he uh, instituted. So um, anyway, so the founders decided that, that we would use the electoral college uh, to determine who would be the president. So every state would determine how, th how they were going to um, uh, decide who would be their electors for the state. And then the electors would, be, would have two votes. They could vote um, for two of the candidates that each state would put forth. So, so this, is, this is different than the electoral college that we know now. 
But something happened shortly after the constitution was put forth. The, con the founders didn't realize, didn't intend for there to be a party system, but um, there began to form two parties. And with the second president of John Adams, he ran against Thomas Jefferson. And so typically what would happen was the candidate who received the most votes would become president and the candidate who received the second most votes would become the vice president. So John Adams won, who was, John Adams was a Federalist and Thomas Jefferson received the second most votes, but he was an anti-Federalist. And so what happened is the president and vice president were, had completely opposite political philosophies and they realized that wasn't gonna work moving forward. And so the, the, our founders put forth the 11th and the 12th constitution. So our founders gave us the first 12 amendments, I'm sorry, first 12 amendments. And then they gave us the amendment 12, which um, said that the president and the vice president could be put on the same ticket. So we wouldn't have opposing uh, people be a president and a vice president. And they also, in the section one of, um, can you hear my little doggy? I'm sorry, my doggy's in the background there. They also said in the section that the, the number of electors that a state will send and, and, and elect, their, uh, elect the president will, will be the total amount of the federal delegation from that state. So for instance, I live in Maryland, Chevy Chase, Maryland. We have eight members of Congress and two senators. So Maryland has 10 electoral votes. All right, so that's how determined. So California has a 55 electoral votes. Wyoming, I think has three or four. So the bigger states uh, have more of a say. Now our founding fathers didn't exactly have confidence in the average citizen. So they devised this electoral method um, and they believe that the states that, ha that have weighted influence relative to their population should have more, more electors. So like I said, California, Texas has 34 electors, but they also realized though um, that this country, because it was a, rep it's a republic. So we, we, we vote for a president and then we send these electors to represent how the, the state went. That way it gives say to the smaller states. If we didn't have the electoral college, the big cities would, would begin to determine every single election, New York, California, Chicago, Philadelphia. And so the country is a melting pot uh, of different types of social groups and it and it gives this electoral college gives each state a unique say and the electoral college also fosters that individual interest that otherwise might be swallowed up in a winner takes all from all the big cities and so I want you to know that typically democrats are the ones that want to do away with the electoral college and because it would probably ensure them having more victories because where some of the concentration populations are, are in these big cities and they're more liberal. But it's very important that you be able to kind of understand and defend the electoral college. What I have found has been really helpful too is Prager University has these one minute, five minute, 20 minute little videos. If you just pull up Prager University electoral college, there will be like 10 little YouTubes and some of them are one minute, some of them are five minutes. And in a real simple term terminology, they explain, you know, almost in just one paragraph, the beauty of why we must retain the electoral college, because there will be a growing uh, argument to get rid of the electoral college, especially when Democrats lose. Because what happens sometimes in close elections, it's actually possible for the popular election to go in the opposite way of the electoral outcome. So you can actually, you know, get a few more of the popular votes and still lose the electoral college count. And that happened with Andrew Jackson when John Quincy Adams didn't get the popular vote, but he got the electoral vote. You need 271 electoral votes. So you, we get that number from 435 members in the House, 100 members of the Senate, and then DC gets three electoral votes. So that equals 
538 electoral votes. You need 271 to win. And remember when Al Gore and George Bush had to go to the Supreme Court because George Bush or uh, Gore had more popular votes, but the electoral votes were very close and Bush actually won, I think by 271 electoral votes. And even Hillary will say, and I think, it, I think she won uh, the popular vote by about 2 million, give or take a little bit more than Trump, but he won the electoral um, vote. And so he became president. And this last election, who knows really how that happened, you know, because I, as some people will say, there was fraudulent uh, activities going on. And so, um, and, and we, we have a problem, don't we? And we're going to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court and some of the rulings of just this last week, uh, as they're not going to, it sounds like going to hear any of the fraudulent election cases that have been put forth to the Supreme Court. So the president has to be a natural born citizen. This is why there was some controversy and flurry about Obama when he ran for president. Was he really born in Hawaii? Was he born in Kenya? You have to be a natural born citizen to be able to qualify to be the president. You have to be at least 35 years old and a resident or living here in the United States for 14 years. That's why Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was so popular, could never be president because he wasn't born in the U.S. of A. And also uh, uh, here, it talks about the 25th Amendment, how a president can be removed from office um, if they die or uh, if they're unable to you know, they have their, maybe they lose their mind, you know, they, they, they're they no longer able to function in, in this capacity. So in 1967, they actually passed the 25th Amendment, which is really fraught with peril, because what that 25th Amendment does, the founders didn't put this 25th Amendment in, this came, you know, 100 years after the Constitution was, was uh, almost written. But what that means is that someone who is unvetted and not voted in by the US, the citizenry can become president. So instance, if for some reason Joe Biden um, dies or is no longer able to hold office for whatever reason, Kamala Harris would become the um, president. And that's, it's interesting to me because see, I believe didn't even receive 1% of the votes during the primaries, during the democratic primaries but she would become our next president. And if she wasn't able to become the president for whatever reason, let's say whatever reason that might be, it would be the Speaker of the House. So it'd be Nancy Pelosi. And then under Nancy Pelosi, if she wasn't able to, it'd be the senior member of the Senate, then the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury. But the problem with that uh, um, um, amendment is it means that someone could be the president of the United States that we have never voted on. And I think what the founders intended was if the president were to die or um, they would have, they would, they would have an election so the people could vote, could vet and put into office instead of having someone that's, that's unvetted. And so also this section talks about the compensation for the president, president right now since 2009, president makes $400,000 a year, plus about $150,000 in travel and other expenses and $19,000. So about $570,000 a year, the president of the United States makes. Now it's interesting, George Washington's salary was 25,000, but George Washington declined to receive any compensation the eight years he was president, which is interesting because remember he was poor, he, he, he was in debt. I mean, bill collectors are coming to his Mount Vernon, but I just think that says so much about the morality and the integrity of this man that he didn't want to get rich. He didn't want to take money. This was a calling and a duty that he felt he had to his country to serve. And, and, uh, and interesting enough, Trump didn't uh, accept any one of his checks. He donated every single one of his checks to like the national parks, Department of Education, the veterans. I think what's interesting about Trump is he lost money. He, his net worth um, declined 31% or about 1.4 billion, they said, when he started his presidential bid in 2015 and ended at the beginning of 2021. 
In contrast, President Obama, when he entered his office, his net worth was 1.3 million. And after eight years, his net worth was 40 million. I'm not quite sure how that happened when they make a, about, you know, 400,000 a year. But this, this was one of the dangers, sorry, one of the dangers of politicians staying in office too long is that they could profit from political connections. My husband's out of town, so normally he takes the doggy, and the doggy is going to talk to us a little bit today. But um, anyways, so section two talks about how uh, the president is the commander of the military, and he can, um, he can give reprieves. That means he can postpone an execution of a sentence, particularly death sentences. He can pardon it's in his power to excuse a person from being punished for a crime or series of crimes. You always see presidents pardon or issue reprieves right before he leaves office. All presidents do that. Richard Nixon was actually pardoned by President Ford. Richard Nixon never even got to the point of being impeached. He just resigned and then President Ford pardoned him. And uh, the Thanksgiving turkey is always given a reprieve every Thanksgiving from each president. So that's, a, that's another example of what a reprieve would look like. And then the president also can make treaties with foreign powers, but he must have two thirds of the consent approval of the Senate in order to make that treaty with an international entity um, binding. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways presidents have been getting around this approval of the Senate is they call them executive agreements and, uh, or, and they circumvent kind of um, uh, this at summit conferences. They'll make these executive agreements with international uh, entities. And also we're seeing this over the last hundred years, presidents have circumvented the legislative branch and started making law through executive orders. Our founders never intended for the president to make law for the entire country. Now he can make law for, um, you know, within his executive branch, dealing with the uh, administrative organizations within his branch, but he's not supposed to make a law for the entire country. That's the legislative branch's duty. And so we're seeing, I mean, you know, Biden did it on, on the first day in, in, in office, he, you know, signed 17 executive orders, Trump did it, Obama did it, they've gotten in the habit and Congress has allowed them to do that. And what would be the remedy for this? An, an act of Congress. Congress could just say, they could just declare, you, you know, put restrictions on these executive orders that the presidents have gotten in the habit of expanding and legislating. And executive orders is not good legislation because it can be overturned just like that when the new president takes office. And, and we, we saw that firsthand a few weeks ago with what President Biden did in overruling some of Trump's um, executive orders. And so um, anyways, also it talks about in section two of article two that it's uh, the president appoints judges, ambassadors and heads of cabinet and the Senate then have to confirm it. And the founders wanted the Senate's approval so that a president might not put unfit people into office or some of his cronies or friends or that are, would be mediocre. And so that was kind of a, a check on the president there. And then section three of article two uh, talks about the state of the union address the president can give and he can recommend certain legislation up on the hill the White House is considered one of the most powerful lobbies on Congress. So it really should be the constituents should have the most sway with members of Congress and, you know, mails and letters and emails and phone calls. But when a member of the White House shows up on Capitol Hill and is promoting legislation, that's a pretty powerful lobby. And then you have party leaders and press and lobbyists that companies um, pay, you know, to, to, uh, advocate for legislation. So um, anyways, okay. And then the president also, it talks about in section three, how he can veto, we talked about this last week, he can veto legislation that comes from Congress, but two thirds of the house and Senate can overrule his veto. But it, there's a little 
a little trick that he has called a pocket veto. And it talks about this in the constitution that if Congress goes out adjourns and the president doesn't sign the bill and Congress has adjourned, has left, he doesn't have to sign it and it, um, the bill does not, cannot go into law. But typically when Congress is in and the president doesn't sign something, it automatically goes into, it automatically becomes a law. But when Congress recesses and the president doesn't sign it, then the bill dies and that's called a pocket veto. And so um, that's, that's something that, that they can do. And then the last section of this second article under the judicial talks about impeachment. We talked a little bit about this last week. Remember the House impeaches and the Senate convicts. So Clinton was impeached, but he was not convicted by the Senate. President Trump was impeached two times in 2019 and 2020, but the Senate didn't have enough votes to convict him. But, but the offenses for which a president can be impeached is treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. And I think this last impeachment, they said that this high crime of insurrection, which the president incited the crowds, that's, that's why he was mm. impeached. Uh, but it's interesting, just yesterday, did you see that hearing on the Hill from the police and so forth, the Capitol Police saying that it didn't look like it was his speech, that, that these people were well prepared when they showed up. They had gears, they had radios, they had hand signals, they had bombs planted. So it looked like it was a pre-planned event. I'm not sure that was uh, probably reported in the newspapers. And so um, anyways, I think that was the grounds up by which Trump was impeached the second time for high crimes and, and misdemeanors, they're saying. And, and no president has ever, interesting enough, ever been removed from office. Uh, they've been impeached, but they've never been removed, convicted by the Senate and removed from office. And, and President um, Nixon, remember, resigned before he could be he probably would have been convicted by the Senate. And so he resigned and he was pardoned by President Ford. Okay, so ladies, that da, 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 is um, the second article, the executive. Now we're gonna move into the Supreme Court. Oh boy, all eyes are on the Supreme Court these days. So we know under the Articles of Confederation before the constitution was formed, that the founders hoped that all the disputes would be solved in the state courts and that wasn't the case. So when it came time to write this constitution, they made way for a federal system of courts and they, they assigned 11 different types of disputes, 11 types of disputes could be heard at the federal level. And so uh, I have to say the Supreme Court kind of holds a near and dear um, place in my heart because that's what led me to my husband. I interned for the United States Supreme Court as a young girl, about 23 years old. And I interned at the curator's office and I would handle these documents that you know the justices had written. But mostly I gave public tours and private tours of the Supreme Court to dignitaries around the country, public tours, and then you know attorney generals. I remember Harry Connick Jr.'s father was the attorney general in Louisiana and I took their family through but Harry Connick wasn't in the group but he it was his father and sometimes the justices if it was a special important VIP group the justices would meet me and they I would turn the time over to to like Clarence Thomas and Sandra Day O'Connor I, I did a little tour with which was kind of exciting Rehnquist was the chief justice when I worked at the Supreme Court and I was getting ready actually to go on to law school. That's what I wanted to do. I was a certified paralegal. So I got to watch a lot of this oral argument in the Supreme Court. So uh, the Supreme Court session is the first Monday in October and, and it ends, stops hearing oral argument the last of April. And then the session ends in June just to give them time to write the opinions that they've heard. And so, um, it was, it was interesting, uh, you, you could take a public tour of the, 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 the Grand Hall and you could even, 
I would take people into the courtroom when they weren't hearing. Uh, so Monday, and this still is the case today, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they hear oral argument and they only hear two cases that day. They hear a 10 o'clock case and an 11 o'clock case. And each case only has 30 minutes each side. So the plaintiff has 30 minutes and the defendant has 30 minutes. So by the time they're hearing these cases, they have received the brief. They know all about the case. They don't need to hear the facts. They don't need any emotion. They're just wanting to question each side on how they are interpreting the point of law in the constitution and why it should be held in their favor. And it was interesting to watch this oral argument because the justices can stop an attorney at any given minute and, and ask him a question. And it's been said that the justices hate it when the um, attorneys read their briefs, that they're supposed to come completely memorized and be able to just have a Q&A if that's what the justices want. But they can't go over for 30 minutes. There's a little lectern light that comes on when they have five minutes and then the light comes on when they're done and they have to sit down. So it was really interesting to see how that process worked. There are nine uh, justices. They serve for life. And um, the chief justice is Roberts. Interesting enough, President uh, Trump put in three of the nine justices. So one third of the court are his appointees. Uh, and that's unusual. Clinton in eight years only had two justices he appointed and same with Obama, only two in eight years and both Bushes had two. So Trump in four years had three justices. Now, I'm still a little concerned about his justices, uh, Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, to be quite honest with you. But uh, Trump also put in Gorsuch, Gorsuch and um, Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. And the Supreme Court is supposed to be the exclusive, ex exclusive guardian of the Constitution. That's what the founders intended. And there are three original um, levels of the federal court, which exists today. We have the federal district court. There's 94 district courts throughout the country. And then there's 13 appellate courts. My little daughter from another mother, little Fran, had just got a clerkship for a judge who sits in the Ninth Circuit, which oversees California, Idaho, mm -hmm. Oregon, I believe. So she's super busy. And a lot of young uh, law grads that clerk for an appellate judge or a Supreme Court judge go on to have amazing careers. It's very hard to get and I'm proud of her. So her little judge is in Idaho. So she graduated from Georgetown and the appellate judge, there's about 10 to 15 appellate judges in each circuit, all right? And then the Supreme Court is kind of the court of final appeal. And there are two types of cases that can begin and end in the Supreme Court. They don't have to go to a district court. The district court really was intended to prevent the Supreme Court from being submerged by appeals. So district court appeals usually are the final say so for most cases, they're just not taken up at the appellate level or certainly at the Supreme Court level. And to be honest with you, most, most cases go through the state courts, all right? So there's, there's three levels in a state court. And then at the state Supreme Court, if you don't like your ruling, you can appeal to, if there's a federal question, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. But um, so this is how it works, girls. And this is how it worked with Trump. Typically every year the Supreme Court will get about uh, uh, seven to 10,000 appeals because um, uh, they haven't been happy with the ruling at the lower court. And really the Supreme Court out of those seven to 10,000 appeals will only agree to consider about 200 of them. And then out of, for further analysis, and out of the 200 that they'll take on to, to consider if they'll hear, they only hear about 100 to 150 cases of the seven to 10,000 appeals. So President Trump, so, so look, the two types of cases that can go directly to the Supreme Court involve foreign countries or ambassadors, or number two, and I believe this is the fraudulent election uh, cases um, believe they had this kind of standing 
where one of the states is a party to the suit and the matter involves federal jurisdiction. So it's interesting that uh, last week, the Pennsylvania case, the Supreme Court said, okay, they would review it. And then they said, we're not going to hear it. We're going to let whatever ruling hold. So they chose not to take up that case. And it looks like they're not going to choose to take up any of those cases that are going to challenge the election results. Now, Justice Thomas wrote a dissent on this. Now, they, so they didn't even hear the case. They were just determining if they were going to hear the case. And then they decided we're not going to hear the case. And Justice Thomas said, I, I read something he wrote about, look, it's not right that we should change the rules in the middle of the game. It doesn't set good precedent for future elections because some of the states change their election laws and rules and their ballot mail-in ballot rules. And Gorsuch and Alito agreed with him, but you have to have five of the justices in order to move forward. And so Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, two of Trump's people, refused to hear these cases, which is a, a little disappointing. And I think some people say that they were afraid to appear like they supported Trump they wanted to appear to be neutral because they're the new kids on the bench and they're trying to promote their credibility and their neutrality. So, you know, instead of appearing to support Trump, they wanted to appear like they were supporting the U.S. Supreme Court. And to be honest with you, there's 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 like two types of justices, an originalist and an activist. And the originalists have a tendency to be more conservative. So they try to discover the original meaning of what the founders meant when they wrote the constitution. And they don't try to impose new interpretations to what the founders have already said they intended. So they believe that if the constitution is silent on an issue, that they shouldn't read rights into it, that it should be delegated back to the states and the people in the states to determine those kind of things, such as abortion or sexual orientation or illegal immigration. Originalists believe that if the constitution doesn't specifically talk about these things, that the state, the state courts should determine, the people who live in the states should determine how that should be handled. And maybe Kavanaugh and uh, Barrett thought because the constitution doesn't specifically talk about fraudulent elections that it should be the states that determine the election laws and uh, procedures of those states. And so I'm just guessing because the six, the six justices that decided not to take up any of these fraudulent cases that have been put forth the past few weeks have um, at least the ones last week declined to say why they were not going to hear and why they voted the way that, that they did. And so that's kind of what we're seeing played out amongst the justices right now. Um, so the, the founders intended the courts to be strict guardians of the constitution and they set up the, the government to have only limited powers and the ones that are not delegated in the in the constitution are to re be referred back to the states and to the people and uh and so thomas jefferson was was worried about uh what he was seeing and he realized there was a major weakness with the courts that they didn't put enough checks and balances on the supreme court the way they put checks and balances on the legislative remember if, if Congress puts forth legislation and sends it to the president, he can veto it. Or, um, or what's another check and balance here for the, or the Supreme Court can declare their legislation in the Congress unconstitutional. And if the president you know, gets out of hand, um, two thirds of the Congress can overrule his veto. And if he gets out of hand, we can just vote him out of office. That's the best check and balance on someone, just vote him out of office but there was no check and balance on the Supreme Court. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, about five years before he died, he said, it has long, however, been my opinion that the germ of dissolution of our federal government is in the constitution of the federal judiciary, 
working like gravity by night and by day, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow, advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the fields of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped from the states. And he also, I like something Jefferson also said uh, when they began to tamper with um, juries in 1885, you know, that was one of the things in section two of um, the third article that they wanted juries because they didn't have juries in England. A judge could, you know, declare you guilty, throw you in the dungeon and you were done. And so in 1885, the Supreme Court excluded juries from determining the law and, and thereby kind of weakened that safety net that the founders had put into place to protect the rights of the people. And Jefferson had almost foreseen this when he said, we need to bind down the federal uh, government for mischief by the chains of the constitution. If the constitution can be changed at a decree of a judge, the, then, the mayor, then it will become a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which may twist and shape it into anything they please. Hence, the purpose of the constitution would be defeated and we would have no reason to have it. So Jefferson and even Alexander Hamilton realized, look, we don't have any checks on an overzealous judiciary. We have checks and balances on the executive and the um, legislative, but the only check and balance we have in the constitution on our Supreme Court and the justices is that they have to be approved by the Senate and that in Article 3, Clause, Section 2, Clause 2, it kind of restricts their jurisdiction, meaning they, it, they have to be able to fulfill, you know, um, what's the word I want to say, a reason to be heard in, in that court. The, you know how there are 11 reasons why a dispute can be heard in a federal court. And so, and, and also it says in the constitution that in article three, that a justice can be impeached for treason, bribery or high crimes, but that's never happened at the federal Supreme court level. So, you know, if, if they put forth an unpopular decision, even when the court has seriously maybe violated its constitutional limitations, uh, by making laws. So what we're starting to see is the, the courts are starting to legislate. Have you heard that expression, legislate from the bench? We really don't have any effective at this point congressional action that can be assertive if they've overstepped their bounds. So what we'll talk about in seminar four is a possible healing of, of this court of of this check and balance that they don't have on the Supreme Court right now by putting forth maybe a judicial restraint amendment where there could be possibly term limits for the justices and maybe two thirds of Congress could override a Supreme Court decision. Just like two thirds of Congress can override a president's veto. Right now we have no way of overriding a, a decision or an opinion of Supreme Court. So that would be a potential judicial restraint amendment to get some control of, of the Supreme Court. So what we're seeing is the executive branch and the Supreme Court is becoming more powerful and the legislative branch is decreasing. So the balance, the checks and balances on the three branches are getting uh, uh, skiddy wampum as my grandma used to say, <laughs> not in balance. So remember the power to interpret law is the power to control and the power to control is the power to destroy. And, and this right now is what we're seeing with some of the decisions that have been coming out of the Supreme Court, particularly in the last hundred years. And so, and ladies, there you have it. That is our class today. So you'll see that really it was a masterful accomplishment what the founders did in achieving what no nation in modern times had ever done before establishing these three branches of government on a firm foundation so that they could balance, that they could work together in a balance, check and balance sort of way. So if you're feeling a little disappointed with some of the things that are coming out of our courts, our Supreme Court, particularly this week, remember, how do we stay anchored in hope? 
We look to God. We don't look to the Supreme Court. We don't look to the president. We look to God for answers. We look for God for deliverance and healing. And we continue to, to take what we're learning and the, and the things that we're feeling inspired to do, to share them with our children and improve and, and strengthen those relationships, make those relationships a high priority in our life, the, our family. And then we learn the constitution from the viewpoint of the founders. And that's what we're doing. Doing. Woohoo! Let's pat ourselves on the back. We're learning what they intended because how can we restore or reestablish something that we don't really even understand? And then if you're doing those things and you're praying and you're in the word and you're trying to, you know, shoot off what you're learning to your kids and keeping them close and you're learning what our founders intended, the spirit will kind of descend upon you and let you know what you should do. And, and girls, you're a perfect example of being guided by the spirit. You are here today for a reason. I think God put into your mind, this is important. I need to learn this stuff. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to show up. And as you keep learning, God will put into your mind, hmm, maybe, maybe I should start a little cottage meeting in my neighborhood. Maybe I should join an organization that has the same, you know, values and convictions as myself. God will let you know what you should do. I have a little, um, so don't cry, don't, don't cry for me, Argentina, but I was in Puerto Rico last week. And when I came home on Monday night, I hadn't really been uh, keeping up with my studies and I knew I was gonna have to teach this class. And I was kind of complaining to my husband when I climbed into bed. And he said something so simple, but so powerful. He said, Julini, have you, have you prayed to know what you should teach? Cause I was like, how am I gonna teach something that takes three years for kids to learn in law school and have it make sense to the, to the ladies? And then he said, have you prayed about it, Julini? So that was the last thing I thought about before I went off to bed Monday night. And when I woke up Tuesday morning, I got on my knees and I prayed to know what to emphasize today that would make the most sense to you. And I, it taught me that, you know, we might not, you know, when we pray, we might not see the big picture, but God will let us know the next right step that we should do. And God let me know the next right step I should do as I got off my knees and I sat down and I began to prepare and it just kind of came. And that's what God will do to you right now when you're considering the state of affairs of our country, of your community, of your family. You go to God and you ask him for help and then you get up. And he might not tell you the beginning from the end, but he will tell you the next right step to do in that moment. And so this is what we are doing, ladies. You know, as we do this, we will, our faith, our, our fear will turn to faith and, and our, you know, our despair that what, some of the things that we're seeing in the news will be converted, I believe, to hope. And as we are hopeful, we will become that stabilizing influence in our families and those around us. You are the stabilizers, mothers and grandmamas, and God will help you as, as you continue to seek his face to help us here. So anyways, next week, we're going to do articles Four, five, six, and seven, states right, how to amend the constitution, the supremacy clause and the ratification. And they're really short and they're straightforward. And then we're gonna discuss the bill of rights, the first 10 amendments that our founding fathers gave us. And we will knock those out. And then the following week we'll do amendments 11 through 27. And we will be constitutional experts after that. <laughs> or at least I promise you, you will know more than most of the people around you after, after we have uh, finished our little four weeks in the constitution. So thank you so much, ladies, for today. I'll stick around. If you have any questions, we can talk about it. My telephone number, if you ever want to text me, area code 240-338-5737. And if we can't figure it out over text, we can talk on the phone. And uh, Vivian is always uh, here to help as well if you have any questions. So thank you so much. And we will see you next week for more fun. Bye.